One thing optometry has been missing is a unified message that explains the importance of eye care. Now, OIE Broadcasting has solved that dilemma. We are very excited to announce the first subscription-based monthly content delivery service that will not only enhance and expand your practice, but elevate the industry. Please visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. That's OIEbroadcasting.com. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day. The first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. So in the U.S., you know, we have the FDA and the one that's commercially, that's approved by the FDA is my site. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you spoke about you're in Canada, so you don't have to deal with the FDA. I don't know if you have something similar. We uh, do. It's all this. You know, we have Health Canada and they're just as it just depends on the flavor of the of the day. It's about the same thing, basically, you know. So what's the brand for astigmatism that you could use from soft lenses for myopia control? So I'll just, you know, we're having a just an open chat here. There are a couple of different brands that you can use, but I tend to reach for Cooper Vision Biofinity. And the reason I like that, it's available with a center D design and has a toric option. And the lens is a fantastic lens and works great. We also have the option for ProClear um, multifocal toric like XR. And that would be an option that gives us even a higher range for astigmatism that's past a 275. Would that give us myopia control though? If you do the multifocal, so if you use the center D distance design, yes. So let's talk about ortho K. What is ortho K? What is CRT? Mm -hmm. uh, explain how that's different than soft lenses for myopia control. Now, soft lenses are worn during waking hours. Oh, and real, real quick, I'm sorry, just to interrupt you. For soft, uh, for soft myopia control lenses, What's the, what can they ex, what can a patient expect for? I know we don't like to use percentages anymore, but what sure. percentage decrease in progression of myopia can you expect? Forty to sixty percent, so right in the same range as the atropine. And the ortho K, when we look at the studies, and this is something I talk about all the time to families making these decisions, because a lot of the time they're going to come to a vision care provider and say, "Just you tell me what to do. What works the best? I could care less." just what is the most effective? And you're like, whoa, you know, they actually all are pretty close to about the same efficacy. So let's talk more about who you are and what your goals are. Let's go further. Let's figure out what actually works in your life and optimize this whole process. Now the ortho K in the literature historically has had just like a touch of a flavor of more efficacy than soft lenses. My site in particular though, the studies with that lens um, the efficacy is very, very high. But again, these are controlled studies where everything's being done perfectly. In the real world, it all kind of works out fairly well. Um, I would say in our practice, orthokeratology tends to attract, you know, the most people come up every day for ortho-K for myopia control, just because it has such a long route in myopia management. Again, all the tools are useful and we need them all. And just explain what ortho K, what that lens is, that it's a harder lens. Explain about that. Yeah. So unlike daily lenses or soft lenses that are worn during the day, a piece of plastic on your eye to give you the vision, just like a pair of glasses, the way that orthokeratology lenses work are we sleep in a small hard lens at night and it temporarily reshapes the eye kind of like a retainer for your teeth when you're sleeping during sleep so that when we wake up in the morning, we remove that lens and it leaves behind the eye in a slightly remolded kind of shape that gives us clear distance vision and myopia control without any glasses or contacts during the day. What are the pros of ortho K or gas permeable? So many pros, so many pros. <laughs> <laughs> All contact lens. So the a huge, I guess the biggest one in ortho keratology and uh, you mentioned CRT. So that's coronary refractive therapy is a design of ortho K lens. And, you know, they kind of, all these lenses have a very similar design and they all, you know, sleep shaping lenses, sleep retainer, night shaping lenses, ortho K, OK lenses. So CRT, they all do about the same thing. 
And I would say probably the biggest pro globally historically has been freedom from glasses or contacts during the day. Um, myopia management is a huge pro, of course, because inadvertently we realized a long, long time ago that by getting that clear distance vision, it was kind of a kind of surprise finding that the myopia control effect happens as well because of the change in the central cornea creates that peripheral kind of plus that we talked about to give the defocus more focus in the side of the eye. Now, the other benefits, you know, ortho K, a big one in our practice um, is that for young children who are not quite ready for having devices on their eye away from their caregivers or the parents aren't comfortable, everything is controlled in the home. So things like compliance with hand washing and touching the eyes and care of the products and solutions, it's very parents, you know, patients like that just because they're able to keep everything in the home. You know, there's very sophisticated design. So we get, uh, we're a lot of, we can fit a lot of variety of people. Talk about what the word reverse geometry is, because that's kind of a cool term and kind of an interesting way that we, a term that we use to fit these type of lenses. Whatever reverse geometry curve is, if you imagine, let's picture our eyeball as like an eyeball. So it's rounded, we'll say at the front. So a contact lens shape, including hard cornea lenses, soft lenses, goes in a round shape that matches that round shape of the eye. Now, what a reverse geometry curve does, and this is the case in orthokeratology lenses, is instead of a nice round shape, we reverse a curve and create kind of a, we'll just call it a square on a circle, so that we get a nice, not pushing down in the center, but it's a feather touch or a close contact point. And underneath the square shape on the side, we have a fluid force then. And that reverse geometry curve is actually what acts as enough of a push and pull effect under the lens to provide the myopia or provide the orthokeratology. So the central flattening and redistributing the cells on the front of the eye temporarily to cause clear distance vision and myopia control in under the reverse curve. We need a diagram because that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. You explained it great. So what kind of patients are good candidates for ortho-K and what kind of patients are not good candidates? Orthokeratology, so two ways. Um, for one, I just want to say that there is no age that matters. Anybody of any age can use orthokeratology, does not have to be kids for myopia control. Um, the best candidates, though, really are those that are not presbyopic yet, that you don't need reading glasses. The ortho-K is difficult to correct. For, for presbyopic patients that need reading glasses, you can do monovision fairly easily, one eye for one distance, one eye for the other, but it's just not practical. Um, the best candidates would be minus prescriptions from about a minus 125, 150 up to about a minus six with up to about two diopters of regular astigmatism. The best candidates for ortho -K also have astigmatism that's shaped centrally, not long apical astigmatism, or pardon me, that is shaped centrally in apical, but not stretched out astigmatism that's limbus to limbus. Although with designs today, there's really the ceiling is high. We can correct all kinds of crazy corneas with ortho -K because we can modify our lenses now to suit those shapes. Why is it only up to minus six? There's limits of what we can do. You know, it takes a lot of pushing and pulling. And what I find is when we go higher to get enough of a fluid force under the lens to actually correct that much minus, we end up with sticky lenses, ineffective treatment. It just doesn't work too well. And so again, it's that kind of range in between that works the very best for ortho -K. You have your patients have a skip a night? When they're older, they can. I mean, they absolutely. And if kids are tired or have a cold or whatever, I'll get regularly. Although I have to say my pet peeve is when they skip the night, their, their one skip a year is the night before their six month ortho -K follow up. And it looks like the treatment is junk. And then you realize after you do all the testing that they took the night off before. Can't that is you gotta make sure that they wear their lenses the night before, but kids will take nights off and it's not gonna not the end of the world. Same thing as atropine. You know, we gotta balance out their life. Some really little kids just need a day sometimes, and it's not gonna destroy their life to take a night off. It does wash out though. So if you take a night off, especially when you're younger and you're not really set into that remodeled kind of corneal shape, 
you're going to drift back and kids don't like that because they'll be halfway blurry if they skip a night. Um, sometimes it works though, just to wear old glasses. Um, and then really little ones, sometimes they just live their little life and not a big deal. Every so often they'll take a night off. I did have a adult colleague that has worn ortho K and, you know, he's in uh, lens designer has worn ortho K for 20 plus years. And he says he only wears them two or three days a week. So that's kind of neat, but that's not how we train new families. And that's certainly not how most patients can wear their ortho K. Now, some people have fear or have trouble removing the lens. What kind of tricks do you have for removing the lens in the morning? Always, always. So I've learned a lot, actually. That's a, interesting that you asked that question. I swear we did not plan this one to anyone listening, but it is a personal, like, I wouldn't say obsession, but it is a personal thing that I've kind of encountered a lot coming back to Alberta from, you know, spending time in on the West Coast in Oregon and being in Houston where the climate is very humid where we run into dry sticky lenses a lot less it's a lot harder in drier climates like alberta that really drew my attention to the complications that can happen if we have sticky lenses and so i've become a huge huge proponent or you know um, i will speak all day about this on lens safety and how to prevent these dry spots as sticky lenses are no good so the things that i've come across um, in the last probably you know 12 months of rigorous, you know, asking everybody that I know globally what they do. Um, the best way to do it to prevent sticky lenses, number one is lens design. So we want to eliminate, make sure that the lenses aren't sticking because the edges are too tight. So we always want to take a minute and look at the lens on the eye, just make sure there's nothing we're missing there. Avoid products with the lenses with a lot of preservative because pr products with preservative or products that are too thick with a bunch of stuff in it can actually cause sticky lenses. Lubricate the eye before you put the lenses on. Do not put the lenses on for too much time before sleep. It should really be the last thing that happens before bed. They can really settle in on an open eye and that causes sticking in the morning. So I do tell families, try not to put them on hours before bedtime, just right before you go to sleep. Then in the morning, when you wake up in the morning, don't take them off right away. Let them get moving for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, one of my colleagues told me the Australians actually take the white of the eye and push on it and push on the top just to pump fluid under that. And I've started doing that and it works great. Um, and then a drop on the eye before you remove it, make sure that it's moving. Tell patients, if you can't feel your lens, it might be stuck. That's a bad thing. If it feels comfortable on the first day, you know, you might have a sticky lens if it's adhered on there. So comfort, not always, you wanna feel that lens moving. And then I've actually gone away more now from utilizing or letting families go too long using a plunger for removal. And the lid technique tends to be able to smoothly just rush a little bit more fluid under that lens and prevent sticky lenses as well. So you're moving away from the plunger. Yeah, like I give kids, I train parents a lot on the plunger just because sometimes little kids I mean, I put a lens on my four-year-old one time just to test it out. Not that she needs it, but I figure we do this to other families all the time. I better pin her down. I had to pin her down and good luck getting a lens off, a hard lens off a little kid who doesn't want it on and off. Sometimes, you know, you got to cut them some slack, use that plunger. It can be really easy. Kids use the plunger all the time too. I have found though for lens removal on sticky lenses, I like the lid technique. The old fashioned way of doing it is great. It just, it slides a bit of fluid under and lifts that lens just a little bit and smoothly takes it off versus sometimes we get that suction and stickiness when the plunger goes on like dead center and you're pulling it off, like the whole thing's sucking your eyeball out and like a squirrel. And so what we try now is to get it moving, get one edge up before the other edge and really just try to delicately do it as opposed to pulling off something from that kind of straight 90 degrees. And how long do you recommend they sleep with the contact lens? Is there a minimum? Uh, per amount? night? Yeah. A minimum six hours. And when you've done this on adults, adults, a lot of adults can't sleep very good. They're poor sleepers. And when you're using ortho K for, for people that are myopic, that don't want to have LASIK, if they don't sleep well and they're not sleeping enough, do you notice that you're not getting enough treatment? Absolutely. Another population that suffers with this that I know I've learned over time that I try to avoid these fits are new parents because they're up and down all night with their kids. And so not getting enough sleep and having to be up and down can be a problem. So that's a lifestyle thing that we would look at for sure. And say somebody has been wearing ortho K for many years, they become an adult and they say, okay, now I want LASIK. 
how long do they have to be out of those, those lenses for? Of course, that creates a nightmare for the doctors because their pres prescription keeps changing and we have yeah. to keep giving them different types of soft lenses to get them through the rehabilitation period. Yeah, so it, every surgeon's just a little bit different. And so one of the things that we do know for sure, I would say out of ortho cave for most would say six to 12 months. Um, so there is a period of time where they're often going to be in glasses or contacts and the washout period can be a long time. Some will bounce back and have a normal corneal topography after about a month, even if they've been in ortho cave for years. Um, there used to be a school of thought. Some surgeons still prefer that it's based on, you know, how many years that they wore those lenses, including corneal lenses, and the times for waiting without lenses can be extensive, sometimes for refractive surgery. Excellent. So let's turn our attention to medical contact lenses. What are medical contact lenses? You know, medical contact lens would be classified as any medical device or a contact lens um, that provides vision, I would say, for patients who cannot normally get that, that vision with commercially available soft lenses or glasses. So a huge population for, you know, medical lenses includes patients who have had trauma, cornea transplants, cornea disease, and severe ocular surface disease patients would all be candidates for medical contact lenses. And what type of contact lens is best for, uh, it's typically used for, as a medical contact lens? There's a lot. That's a tough one because, you know, I would say on average, if you were to, you know, look at what's out there, scleral lenses have gained so much popularity in the last decade that they would be considered a go-to for patients requiring what we would kind of consider to be medical lenses. Um, but there are lots of different devices that we have uh, available to us in the toolbox. And they all have a place, including our custom soft hybrid lenses that have the hard center and soft skirt. Cornea lenses are still very, very important to keep in a practice. And scleral lenses may be one that is, you know, most commonly used, but certainly not necessarily more important than other modalities when we're looking at the best fit for a patient. Explain what a scleral lens is. Well, it's a large lens. So it's a, it's a kind of true to its name. So it vaults the cornea and the sclera lens lands on the sclera. And if you ask some of our researchers out there, you also have to remember that it lands on the conjunctiva overlying the sclera. So it's a technically conjunctival sclera lens, but we call them sclera lenses. They are hard lens material. And by vaulting over the cornea, they hold fluid on the eye during wear that acts to neutralize irregularities and also protect and bathe the eye when it needs it, preventing exposure and helping to heal dry spots and providing clear vision on eyes that need that smoothed over surface to be able to see. And what has been found in the research when you have somebody with one of these disease corneas or these disease conditions, which we'll get into in a little bit, but how does it help with inflammation? Well, it depends. So contact lenses actually can create a little bit of inflammation and scleral lenses in particular, when we first put them on the eye, even in cases where the intention is to decrease inflammation long-term, we sometimes do see inflammation happen on the eye as the eye adjusts to it, similar to the atropine in the first month or three months, the eye is going to respond to this foreign body on it. And in some cases, it actually creates a little bit of inflammation, especially as we're getting used to the device and putting, making changes where we're causing maybe inflammation by the fitting relationship on the eye when it's not used to wearing something or inflammation from oxygen levels that are different than the eye when it's not wearing a lens on it. So I think the goal is always with any medical treatment is to decrease inflammation, but with contact lenses, sometimes we have to manage a little bit of inflammation that's caused by the devices themselves. So we have this big contact lens that's being put on the eye. What kind of fluid are we putting in that contact lens to help bathe the eye? Preservative free saline and preservative free filling solutions. Um, today, uh, depending on where you are in the world, there are products that are available that, you know, very closely match the tear chemistry with the right pH and components in it. Probably what's globally most used is preservative free saline um, or Addy packs that are just kind of clear of everything. And uh, uh, there are all kinds of different solutions though in research that we're starting to use behind the bowl. And now these lenses are sometimes used for dry, very, very severe dry eyes, somebody with autoimmune disease. 
What do the studies have shown, have shown us with scleral lenses and severe dry eyes? Studies are extensive in that area. And one of the ways that we manage or kind of look at scleral lenses in that whole picture um, when it comes to dry eye patients is actually more of a, as a last resort. And so in our dry eye population, we typically will treat dry eye first and try to manage the systemic underlying cause for it, any structural issues, manage the lid health and the, you know, the um, inflammatory component of dry eye. Um, and then if some of those other things fail or a patient has comorbidities, such as irregular eye shape, can't see great with glasses, are needing an optic that only a hard lens can provide, then we consider scleral lenses in our dry eye patients. How about comfort? What percentage of the people actually are comfortable and what percentage or about percentage don't even need artificial tears anymore or moisturizer? Yeah, it's such a great, so we have interestingly found that scleral lenses are much more comfortable than patients would realize. And that's why they're so popular. You know, contact lenses that don't touch the cornea. So vaulting over, we actually avoid stimulating the nerves that create the feelings of dryness. And so scleral lenses, even on the very first time that somebody puts them on, are very, very comfortable. Would they replace artificial tears completely? I would say no, not necessarily. Depends. So some patients require uh, the tears to keep that lid and the lens nice and smooth and really bad dry eye. However, there are a lot of patients that normally would be, especially severe ocular surface disease, putting drops on every hour. Now that the eye is bathed in fluid, like a spa for their eye all day, they don't need those drops as much anymore. And so it just depends on the case. If we're dealing with the lid dryness or if it's the cornea itself that needs that protection, we're protecting now, we don't have that exposed cornea sensitivity, then we see a decrease in drops for sure in those patients. And how about tear osmolarity? That's been big over the last 10, 15 years. You know, tear osmolarity is interesting because it really fluctuates. And so what we see in dry eye patients is higher osmolarity usually and irregular osmolarity between the eyes. So meaning that if we have an eye that's a little bit too dry, full of all the tear stuff, there's more stuff in that water of the tear that's high osmolarity. And in dry eye patients, we see that it may be actually not consistent. So the tears are there one minute, then they're breaking up. And that causes sometimes a difference between the right and left eye. We see that a lot. And so the osmolarity values when we're wearing our scleral lenses are often a little bit more consistent. Um, but that's just one measurement that we do use in dry eye workups when managing dry eye for sure. And it doesn't really play a huge role in scleral lens um, actual, you know, wearing those lenses. Um, as, as far as the osmolarity of the tear reservoir, though, really important because when we look at what's back behind that bowl, Anything we put back there is typically part of that is always going to stay. Plus the eye is going to be its own living kind of thing, putting things behind the bowl too. And so osmolarity underneath the tear reservoir can be a little higher depending on what's back there in patients that wear sclerals. One thing optometry has been missing is a unified message that explains the importance of eye care. Now, OIE Broadcasting has solved that dilemma. We are very excited to announce the first subscription-based monthly content delivery service that will not only enhance and expand your practice, but elevate the industry. Please visit oiebroadcasting.com and sign up today. That's oiebroadcasting.com. About 75% of the patients who wear sclerals have corneal irregularities. So these people cannot see very well with soft contact lenses or even regular hard contact lenses, oh, they're very uncomfortable. Can you talk about some of the corneal regularities that these contact lenses can help? And maybe some stories of patients that you've seen where you've seen some great things happen. So many great things. And typically we get just as, it, oh, don't get me started. I had one today. Actually, no, I'm sorry. He was in today for a follow-up, but the event actually happened. And this is so, so common where it was a patient with severe, severe um, ectopic keratoconjunctivitis, all kinds of scarring and really, really decreased vision, has never worn, been able to wear a contact lens. Young guy in his 20s has had such a medical history and just has been putting up with basically low vision. You know, you put these devices on to these people. One of the reasons I just love medical lens so much is it's kind of like instant gratification in some cases. It's just wonderful because 
you know, he took a look at his own arm and was just, whoa, I didn't even realize I had all these scars. It didn't even upset him because he was seeing so well at the world. We had him up to, from basically non-seeing because of all the, you know, ocular surface issues to seeing 20, 30 in one eye for the first time in who knows how many years, he was blown away, tears in his eyes. He's so happy, love whatever he's seeing, he's loving it because he's seeing it. And that's very, very common. Patients regularly will tell us, you know, they're unable to care for their families or, you know, unable to, you know, fulfill their daily activities. And the lenses are just a huge, huge player um, in kind of providing a way to be at a higher vibration in your life, you know, be with your loved ones, see your loved ones. You, they make the joke of, oh, now I can see my wife, you know, those kinds of things. And uh, so typically though, the, the cases that we see in terms of the irregular cornea, um, we have injuries, so scarring, and then we have corneal irregularity that includes conditions like keratoconus. Um, ectasia is a condition that can happen where from a surgical procedure or another form of disease in the cornea, the eye can get a little bit too thin in some spots. So not necessarily keratoconus, but it will change shape. Um, and when it's really bumpy and irregular, we can't get good vision with glasses anymore. And so those are the cases that we tend to use scleral lenses on the most. Where we vault over the irregularity, give them great vision. We're just heroes on the spot. It's lovely. It would be like somebody who was wearing glasses and they took the glasses and they bent it. And now you can't see very well. And now we're putting this special piece of plastic on, uh, on top of it and the tears fill in. And it's like a miracle where patients can see. I've okay. seen post-LASIK patients. I had a post-LASIK patient come from Mexico, actually my sister-in-law who had LASIK and she was left with 2200 vision. She mm -hmm. couldn't work. She couldn't take care of her kids. They didn't have an option for her in Mexico. And she had to fly all the way to the US and I was able to fit her with these type of lenses and lo and behold, she could see again. It's amazing. It's so much fun. <laughs> so even things like, you know, people have really bad things like Stevens Johnson's disease. Mm -hmm. So if you could talk about something like that, how we, that we could help. Those cases, are, and you know, graft versus host, corneal transplants, you know, all of these conditions. Steven Johnson's is a horrible, horrible thing for people to go through. Um, that population is heavily dependent on scleral lenses usually. Um, and the main reason, of course, is just the ocular surface is just too damaged 100% of the time for them to have any usable, comfortable vision. And the lenses act as a protective shell and provide vision at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, we that's a huge population that's absolutely at the level of being an essential medical device because they are not safe and comfortable otherwise because of the open wound, essentially, that's always on the front of that eye. One of our most challenging cases of patients are people with neuropathic pain. Uh, people that might have had post LASIK and they have pain, but they have no signs of what's wrong with them. And, it, and, and there's been times where scleral lenses have been able to help these people. They do. And it's, there's most patients actually probably more times than not, we can help them. Um, but there is actually a population that we can't always help. It's really an interesting case. Um, we get referrals a lot for patients with kind of neuropathic pain of some kind where horrible, horrible symptoms, no signs. And when we're managing these patients, it's very, very helpful to do um, testing with scleral lenses to look and see if it is something that we can help with the medical device. Usually with these patients, they're either going to experience relief or not. If they don't experience relief with either an alkane test, putting the numbing drop on the front surface or putting a lens on, it's always best to really have a really careful discussion with them about the expectation that it just might not be the right thing for them because they should experience relief when the device goes on. And a lot of patients, it does. It'll kind of just dampen that. Um, the sensation, the sensory pathway is cut right out and it can give a lot of relief for those patients. And Mayo Clinic found that they really have to have a very big lens. Yeah, absolutely. So larger, the better for those types of patients. Um, and that's the same case for dry eye as well. Let's talk about neurotrophic keratitis. How can we help those people? Huge need. Those are tough ones. And we see neurotrophic keratitis in a variety of different conditions. Number one is 
um, when we have systemic disease that creates a decrease in sensitivity. So diabetic patients sometimes, um, patients that have had herpatic infections, things like that, they may have um, the decreased corneal sensitivity that in extreme cases actually leads to open wounds on the eye because they cannot feel it if they have a dry spot that grows and grows and grows. Now, another population that's particularly impacted would be post-surgically, sometimes eyes that have had transplants or other procedures, they're high-risk eyes to start with, have less sensitivity, can't feel a complication. So those are really, really tough cases to manage because you have to be so careful about safety. They can't always tell you until something's gone too far south where there's an ulcer, close to perforation, all kinds of complications. And so scleral lenses in those cases, it's kind of two things that you need to be mindful of is number one, if you're using a scleral lens on a patient that has decreased corneal sensitivity, number one is follow them regularly so that you can catch problems, educate, educate, teach their loved ones how to look and see if the eye looks red, but they're not bothered too bad, get them into the clinic so we can take a look at it. Now, the flip side, though, about how the sclerals are so valuable in those cases is protection. So once we rehabilitate an eye that has the neurotrophic keratitis, always manage underlying systemic conditions if you can, but sometimes there's only so much you can do with that peripheral neuro neuropathy where um, the sensation is decreased. And what we use the scleral lenses for is on recurrent erosions and things that happen in these patients, we we'll use the scleral lens for good vision over scars that happen and also to protect the eye from further damage. Let us explain what neurotrophic keratitis is. So neurotrophic care, so we have neuropathic pain. So we imagine that as kind of the firing we have that sensory. Neurotrophic keratitis would be a decreased sensitivity that's again, secondary to surgical trauma or systemic disease that decreases the sensitivity in our nerves. And then in keratitis meaning, inflammation of the cornea. So these patients often won't really blink very often. We see it sometimes in Bell's palsy or where the, an eye does not really have the right function. And what happens is the eye without that sensory to blink and refresh the tears all the time starts to slowly get little dry spots and defects that can turn into huge ulcers before you know it and perforate the eye in extreme cases. And so we're always hunting to try to avoid that protection with sclerals is one way that we help them. And there's actually a medication now for that, Oxavite. Yeah. And do you have any experience with that? Not directly. It's too expensive in Canada. So we learned about it a lot. And at the university, we started to talk about it with patients if their insurance was good enough. Um, but I personally have not used it. I think it's just like anything. I think it has a lot of promise. But in a clinical practice, when people are out of pocket, it still is pretty high cost. So I don't have experience with it personally. So how do we fit these type of lenses? What are some of the ways that we could fit it? What's our goals in fitting it? So the way that we fit the lenses is typically um, we start by evaluating the eye um, as a physical structure to fit. And that helps us to decide what lens design is the most appropriate. Today's scleral lens fitting is really, really amazing. You know, we have ways that we can fit the lenses empirically by taking digital scans and essentially creating almost like an impression-based image that we can then translate into digital data into a lathe and make a lens that way. We can also fit scleral lenses today by using diagnostic lenses where we place a known shaped lens on an eye, even if we don't know the shape of that eye. We can use the fitting relationship with our you know, technology, such as slit lamp with fluorescein and other kind of fitting things like using an OCT to take cross sections of the way that that lens looks on the eye. And then we do kind of trial and error and fit a lens that way. So the two streams, digitally data-driven first versus diagnostic fits. And interestingly, talking about dry eye, they, again, they both have their place. Well, often, even if we have this amazing technology to essentially scan an eye and get data to create lenses in our dry eye population, and when we're determining visual acuity, we still use the diagnostic lens set to be able to place a lens on the eye, look at what the best vision can be, calculate the prescription, and show the patient what it's like to wear a lens. Test the patients with you know, the nerve pain and see if it actually dampens it or not. Because if it doesn't dampen it, why would we go and design this great digital kind of glove fit lens? It's just beautiful when, you know, the patient cannot wear it anyways. And is that the same as imprinted uh, lenses or? or yeah, I mean, it's different. So the imprint style, we can take a, pl 
plastic imprint of the eye and create a mold essentially of that eye shape. And that is something that's been done for well over a decade um, by the iFit and iPrint group. And now we actually have technology and things like, you know, profilometry and different types of extensions of corneal topography where we can actually digitally get the imprint. And that has just been such a fun area for me. Let me tell you, oh, the, the stuff we can do today with digital scans and creating different lens designs with software. I mean, the, the sky's the limit and it's been a huge blast. We're just starting to get the technology so that it's good enough to be able to take scans and create lenses in a variety of different ways and with a variety of different manufacturers. And so, you know, today we utilize all of those different technologies. Now, impression-based arguably may still be more precise for really extreme ocular shape irregularities. And we use impression-based oftentimes at the same time as digital scans in our practice so that we have kind of double the data. And then we can pull both sides and look and see which is looks the cleanest. Because as you know, with anything really in life, junk in equals junk out, right? So you have to make sure that we have the right quality of data. So sometimes the scans and imprints in really tough shapes will go nicely together. Um, and then we can uh, build these amazing devices, these medical devices that just blow my mind daily at our practice with the cool things that we can do. And then diagnostic fitting, I mean, I fit them that way almost every day as well. It just depends on the case and what the shape looks like of the eye to decide what modality and what fitting style to start with. And then what kind of lens features do we need? You find the molds better or the imprinted lens better or, you know. They all have their place. So I'm a digital girl these days. I love, you know, if I can avoid, if I can take a scan, I still always put lenses on eye, especially in the first time we meet somebody so that we know their visual acuity with a hard lens. That's very important and to show them the feeling. Um, but I, I think that they all, if the data is, that's the caveat though, if the data is good, they all work and they all work well. So a plastic mold on the eye, kind of like a dental mold for your teeth versus a digital scan versus my brain deducing the square, the shape and making this lens with the diagnostic lens. Those are all can be done very, very well. And it just comes down to what is the most practical for your patient. What do you have in your clinic for equipment? Luckily, we tend to have all the bells and whistles so I can pick and choose what I want to do on the day, depending on my mood and lipstick color. I'll just, you know, make a decision on the fly. Some patients we measure with every tool because they're tough and we want to get more data and more data is always better as long as it's good data. So as we finish up, just a couple of things. How about deposits on the lens? Do you have any tricks for that? I do. Had a patient about two hours before I popped onto this call with you mm -hmm. with this meeting, which was a heavy depositor. So he um, you know, very, very severe ocular surface disease, um, has a history of, I wouldn't say Stevens Johnson, but, you know, pharmaceutical, to you know, toxicities and um, just severe Sjogren's as well, the, all the things autoimmune, he's 77 years old. And he presented with his second free forum design today that I made him. And his first lens had such bad deposits in four hours that I had to change things right away. And we added um, hydropig coating on the second lens. Um, I started treating his inflammation on the front of the eye. So we taught him how to rinse the eye a little bit before the lenses went on. And one thing I taught him today, which is kind of fun, is called the squeegee technique. And what that is for our heavy depositors is, so number one, your lens gets deposits as you're wearing it. Start by putting a drop on the eye that does not have preservative, try to keep it lipid free, see if that works. Number two, if it's not enough, pull out your squeegee. So you take your small plunger on its side and me, me, just plunge, kind of squeegee, just like you're squeegeeing a windshield. And then number three, if you have to take it off, the rubbing. So you need to use peroxide and give it a little gentle rub and that'll remove deposits. Now, there's of course treatments like Progent that we use, but with certain coatings, um, you know, we're not always compatible with the heavy, heavy cleaners. So the very best is rubbing. And then I also always have them avoid, you know, oils on their hands and soap on their fingers, anything that can create a poor tear film that's too oily on the lens um, can exacerbate the tendency for patients that are heavy depositors to deposit. And don't forget deposits happen on the front and back surface. And that's where that little gentle rub on the inside is really important for patients that deposit. Who came up with that squeegee technique? 
Uh, you know, I first heard of it from my mentor at Pacific University, Pat Caroline, but I believe Lynette Johns plays a role in that. I remember there was a group, I think with Lynette and probably a couple others that came up with that. And actually, you know, at one point they all worked together as well. So um, my personal experience came from Pat Caroline. Um, I'm quite certain that others have learned it from Lynette Johns and probably the two of them and many others have utilized this technique and talked about it. That hydro peg, how, how effective is that? It's good for a lot of patients. Yeah, it works great, nice and slippery. So it definitely um, is one more tool in the toolbox. I do have patients that don't need it and it gives us a little bit more flexibility with solutions if we don't use it. Um, but I would say for dry eye patients, probably at least seven out of 10 I have in hydro peg for sure. And midday fogging, what happens? How do you treat that? So a variety of different things can be used for midday fogging. Um, typically, number one, we want to start by adjusting our lens fit to be optimal, just like our ortho-K, because if we have a non-optimal fit of the edges being um, not the right uh, alignment on the sclera or areas of too much clearance in particular, that will increase our midday fogging. Now, we need to differentiate what kind of midday fog are we dealing with. And so we have post-lens reservoir fogging, we have front surface non-wetting, just kind of um, depositing kind of a dirty windshield. Then we have midday fogging that's actually not even related to the lens. And that would include things like an air bubble under the lens or corneal edema. So we do rule those things out. Make sure because we have to manage edema, we have to manage air bubbles and dry spots. Assuming it's not one of those two things, true midday fog, the post lens reservoir fog, we typically manage it with once the fit is how we want it, more viscous solution in the bowl, managing ocular allergy. So we may have the patient start taking an allergy drop at night or utilizing some other form of inflammatory control. And that tends to help things as well. Um, and those are kind of the major things that tend to work the best. I might change solutions sometimes too. So we'll go from using a standard Addy pack, for example, to something that has a different pH and see if that works for the patient. Um, when, when we put the viscous solution, usually it's two drops of a thicker solution and fill the rest with the saline. And that's enough to help most patients with the midday fog. And the last two questions I want to ask you is, do you use piggyback lenses anymore? I do. And it's funny because funny, that's Explain you and I are, are like on the and same and brainwave. Brain it's like, it's like you're in my practice because I just randomly in the last couple of months have ran into some failures with no matter what I do with these fancy features on our scleral lenses to try to manage corneal edema in patients that absolutely need the hard lens. And I've actually had to put some non-optimal corneas back into piggybacks because it's the only thing I can get them to work. And I love them. It's just another tool. We love to have access to everything. And I've had recently actually probably comeback of three in the last two months that have done beautifully with piggybacks. Just explain what it is real quick. Piggyback is a cornea lens. So it's the same hard optic as we put in these scleral lenses. But instead of the lens vaulting over the cornea, it's a small lens that rests on the cornea. And in particular, patients that have dry eye or an irregular shape where the cornea lens that is landing on it might be uncomfortable or rock off, we actually put a little cushion lens underneath it. And it's called a piggyback. So we usually use just a standard air optics lens with, with high DK, so lots of oxygen to get through as a cushion and place the hard lens on top of it as a piggyback. It's a good so little a system. soft lens first and then a hard That's lens. That's right, yeah. It. And mm -hmm. my last question, do you use fenestrations anymore? Explain what fenestrations are and, and do you use it anymore? Oh, it's so fenestrations are the new black. And I just said this on another <laughs> podcast a week ago. That's so funny because Fenestrations are amazing. And we actually have started using them a lot. Um, what fenestrations are, uh, they are little holes that can be placed in some part of the scleral lens. Um, I believe it was Don Ezekiel um, who started using these in a triangle shape of three larger fenestrations a number of years ago and practitioners in some cases have had a hard time with this because of the big air bubble that goes under the lens and I'll kind of circle through and the purpose being to kind of provide more oxygen and I'm still working on that system but uh, what we've been sort of finding and this is only I don't have evidence based on this I think that there's a lot of us experimenting with fenestrations I love them for patients that I need another way to get oxygen to the eye and I love them for suction. And what that means is 
a lot of scleral patients, even if they're, the lenses are fit and they're trained how to take them on and off, there's always going to be some resistance back until you break the seal of that lens. Patients with really deep lenses, less dexterity, are very prone to pulling on the lens and suctioning a little bit, even just a little bit every time they take that lens off is going to increase rebound hyperemia, red eye with contact lenses. And so I love the fenestrations lately. I'm just doing it on, I wouldn't say everybody, but I grab them a lot right now to decrease suction and just little small fenestrations at you know two and 10 o'clock work really well for that. And in some cases, we're experimenting with placing fenestrations over areas of the eye that are prone to edema. And it's been helping a lot of our patients when combined with other, you know, lens design features like highly oxygen permeable plastics. And in some cases, channels that go through the lenses or vaults in certain areas, fenestrations, and there's all kinds of cool things. So yeah, fenestrations are kind of neat. And we should do a talk just on fenestrations. I was telling Roya, who I was met with, Roya and Jimmy with the try not to blink group the other day that we should at our next big contact lens conference in Las Vegas in January, I think it's time to have a fenestration round table because there's a lot I don't know about it. I just do stuff and I'd love to hear from other practitioners what the heck they're doing out there with these fenestrations because they've been around for a long time. And I think there's a lot of potential to just reapply them in different ways that we haven't used them, you know, before. Yeah. And they felt out of favor for a while. And now it's coming back into favor. That's right. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't degrade vision. So it's really, That's right. really something that could help patients. I want to thank Dr. Sheila Morrison for joining me today. She's a wealth of knowledge. Uh, people want to find out more about you. How can they do that? Uh, contact me directly through our, my clinic is Mission Eye Care in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, my email is drm at missioneyecare.ca, and you can find me on our clinic website, probably the easiest. Um, I'd be love to connect with anybody that would like to talk more about these topics. So if you need help and you have the specialty type of diseases that you can't see out of, call Dr. Morrison. I think she could help you. So I want to thank everybody for watching today. I want to thank Dr. Morrison. She's really a wealth of knowledge. And this is Dr. Kerry Gell for Open Your Eyes. Thank you for watching. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.